Good evening, everybody. My name is Rod Escaola, and I'm your condominium lawyer with Gowling WLG. And welcome to this February edition of our monthly condo advisor webinar. Um, now, I don't want to get everybody excited tonight, but this may be the first webinar where we're not exclusively going to be talking about COVID. So that's the first yay of the evening. Um, uh, yesterday, during our preparation talk, we actually thought that there was nothing to report on the COVID front. Like, how, how exciting is that? But uh, fear not, I think that uh, at 4.50, uh, Doug Ford made an announcement that eventually he would make another announcement. So, so who knows, something's coming down the pike, but uh, it was in time with our webinar. Okay, so I'm not gonna promise that we're gonna skip altogether over uh, COVID. Now, um, where am I at here? So what we're gonna be talking about tonight if we don't talk about COVID, is another very interesting topic. Um, I'm very excited about that, actually. It's privacy and technology at this age of virtual meetings and electronic voting. And ever since I brought up the topic, we've been swamped with questions. We've been flooded uh, on this topic. So it's, I think it's a timely topic and I think it's a topic of interest and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Now, as usually, I, what I've done is I call the usual crew and uh, tonight, as I said, we have an additional guest. Thank goodness we had him around to help us with our technical difficulties initially. And so I was looking for a theme. What theme could I use today to introduce our crew? And so I thought, well, after 10 months of pandemic and after a whole month of staying at home, maybe the topic could be Looney Tunes, right? <laughs> and so let's start with that. Okay, so here's the list of speakers. Our first speaker from Lash Condo Law speaking on behalf of CAI Canada, a leader in the industry with a creative mind, always looking for a solution to help the industry. We have Denise, what's up doc, Lash. Hi, Denise. Hi, everyone. Somebody had to get Bugs Bunny, Denise, sorry, it's you. <laughs> and from Crossbridge and speaking on behalf of ACMO with a motherly care. And what you'll see here, folks, three very different <laughs> style of management. I'm lining this one up. So there's three different managers oh, no. coming next and you'll get to see the different styles here. So with a motherly caring heart, uh, always caring for the owners, but always also knowing who had too many cookies. We have Catherine Emma Webster Gow. <laughs> Great to Hi, see Anna, everybody Catherine. tonight. Did, did you make it in? Is she in? I did. I in. Thanks very much, Rod. Okay, you're in. Great. Wonderful. From Daz Service, uh, um, always looking to improve the condo planet, always on the lookout for any sign of intelligent life. We have Jose Marvin Delonchin. Nice. <laughs> Jose, you on? <laughs> yeah, I think this one's your favorite one, actually. It is. Uh, it's your Mar favorite character. Mar and perfect. <laughs> That's right. From Apollo Property Management, Director of Condominium Management at Apollo, always cautiously looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. Sean, do you know what's coming? I am afraid. We have <laughs> Sean Cornish. Hey, Sean. Uh, Thanks that's for a being little with too us out. tonight. Thanks, Rod. Oh, and you're welcome. From the National Life Safety Group, helping the condo world avoid chaos, his appetite for safety knows no bound. Always calm, cool, and collected. We have our own Jason, Tasmanian Devil Reed. How, Jason, you on? Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and accept the Oscar award on MD Jason's behalf. He just emailed me that he's actually dealing with an on-site client emergency. And so uh, he, he's actually going to be held up. His, his commitment to safety is, in fact, that intense. Okay, wonderful. Great. So then we have our two condo twins tonight, reunited again, the two condo twins, your condo lawyers with Galling WLG. Graham, I'm going to start with you here. Our governance enforcer, he's very, very good at it. Nice. There it is, Graham Elmer McPherson. That's before your beard, eh, Graham? Yeah, that, that actually, that photo was taken of me of 2016. If anybody's curious... Look him up on the uh, Go uh, Gowling's website. You'll see him without the beard. And yeah. so we are now moving on to David. David, our gunslinging litigator, patient and forgiven until you're in breach, then say your prayers. We have David Yosemite Sam. Okay, David, are you on? I am. Nice. Hi, everyone. I think he just quit. I think he, 
he just quit. He just walked home. He said, that's enough. I'm not paid enough for this, Rod. <laughs> that's basically what he's saying. And so we also have Adam, uh, our Curry from Condo Voter. You don't get a, a, a character because that's sort of the policy here. Our, our guests don't, uh, we don't mock our guests the first time around anyways. So no uh, thanks for joining us tonight, uh, Adam. Thanks for having me, Rod. Happy to be here. Okay, so as usual, Thank you. So as usual, uh, the question lines are live. The uh, chat line is live. Um, hopefully we have Michael Clifton and maybe even if we're lucky, we have Murray Johnson to uh, keep the, uh, the discussion going and under control. I'm counting on you folks. And before we j jump in the usual disclaimers, um, for those of you watching the webinar, keep the following in mind. We are Ontario centric, so we're going to mainly focus on Ontario. You may need to adapt uh, some of what we say to your jurisdiction. The information we're providing tonight is, to the best of our ability, accurate as of 5.09 on, I guess we're February 2nd, I think, 3rd, February 3rd. Most importantly, the information we give tonight is general in nature. Uh, I mean, we can't answer all of your questions. Uh, what we're doing tonight is not act providing real actual legal advice. We're providing you with legal sort of flavored information, but you may need to retain you know, an engineer or a lawyer or a property manager or somebody that actually knows what they're talking about and uh, put your specific situation to them. Finally, I need to say that this uh, episode is being recorded. It's going to be uploaded on the Condo Advisor website. Um, it usually takes about a week or so. And if you ever want to watch on demand past webinars, all you got to do is uh, go to the Condo Advisor website to the top right. There's a, a webinar tab and that will bring you to past episodes. Uh, what else do I have here? Did I do everything? Yeah, I think we got it. The topics tonight are, well, a quick reopening Ontario update. Um, and then we're going to dive into privacy and confidentiality and, and all of that good stuff with, in the context of this new sort of virtual digital world. Uh, we're handling uh, emails differently. We're email, emailing people where before we may not have. We're voting electronically. And so there's all sorts of questions that stem from that. But before we do, I'm going to turn the microphone to Dave. I think it's David that's giving us the COVID update uh, today. Am I right? Yeah, that's me. So I'll do this pretty quickly because last time we, uh, we, we all met together, we were kind of looking into the future because it, it had not yet come into play, the stay-at-home orders and the, uh, the gray zone lockdown. But now we're kind of coming at least to the end, we think, maybe of the, of the deadlines. So we're still under the state of emergency until at least February 9th. Uh, it's possible this is going to be renewed, especially when we look at the uh, stay-at-home order and the advanced, uh, the enhanced public health measures that are uh, still extended until February 11th. Um, all businesses must continue to allow uh, any employee who can work from home to do so. Indoor organized public events uh, prohibited. Outdoor organized public events limited to five, and that's only if you're able to social distance. Uh, still masks required in indoor areas. And there are more enforcement tools that are being that were provided to uh, the bylaw officers and different um, uh, police authorities as well. And we've seen a lot of stories recently of fines being issued to uh, businesses, uh, big box stores was, was one of the big blitzes they did recently, uh, and shutting down some uh, some parties and other events. Um, as Rod mentioned earlier, there was uh, I noticed on Twitter at about four fifteen another announcement that uh, uh, there there will be an announcement next week about perhaps loose some rules. Uh, it might be something similar to in Quebec where they've now opened up a few more of the non-essential businesses, but we'll have to wait and see for that. Uh, until then, we're still in uh, the same holding pattern. Okay, wonderful. Uh, something else to keep in mind, I guess, is the amenities, recreational amenities. Uh, certainly that is our interpretation, our reading of the uh, stage one uh, rules or regulations. I know that there's some different interpretations out there and there's some condo corporations that are indicating that maybe they're getting different signals from either the uh, municipal public health or the provincial public health. Uh, I think caution is still the word of the week and of the day. And, and so before you open your amenities, you really want to make sure that you consult with somebody um, as there are fines. But most importantly, I think the stakes are much higher than the fines. If, 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 if in fact, there's a situation or a community flare up, you don't want that to be under your watch. So there it is. That's for that. Let me move on to the. Oh, 
Did you cover this, David? I split it in two uh, screens because the printing was too small. Yeah, no worries. Point. Yeah, same thing. I, I just, just more specific, right? The condos, again, masks and the common elements. Uh, and then amenities, as you mentioned, closed and no events should be uh, being held in person. Yeah. I was wondering why you weren't covering that, but you are. Okay, wonderful. So next topic is this. As I said, we want to focus on, on privacy in this digital new world that, that the condo land is, is sort of navigating through. Um, last spring, the Condominium Act was amended to allow uh, a new way of doing business exceptionally for a limited period of time. And for instance, uh, owners' meetings were allowed to proceed virtually, whereas before you would have needed a bylaw to do so now you don't need a bylaw all of this is valid until the end of may but the province is consulting uh ontario right now to see whether they should implement that permanently and that's maybe that's a bit we decide to talk about it today so the changes that were made last spring are uh, owners meetings can be done virtually even if you don't have a bylaw board meetings can be done virtually even if you don't get the consent of all directors because normally under the condo act you need the consent of all the all of the directors but for this period of time until may even if you don't have the consent of all you can hold your meetings your board meetings virtually um, communications to owners or i should say maybe notifications to owners can be done by emails even if you haven't obtained ahead of time their consent so the old sort of a pattern was you needed an owner to consent to email notification. Now until the end of May, you don't need that consent. You can just go ahead and send uh, notifications. Um, and electronic voting was also allowed without a bylaw. Again, this is in place until the end of May, but the province is consulting us on that. And so a lot of questions comes from that, uh, flow from this. Uh, can condominium corporation provide uh, owner information to a third party provider, like condo voter, for instance? Um, what privacy legislation applies to condo land? Does um, PIPEDA, or as uh, Graham says, PIPEDA, um, uh, apply? Uh, and uh, he's probably right, by the way, uh, in how to pronounce it. Uh, what about the anti-spam legislation? Does that apply to condo line? And, and so on and so forth. There's all these questions that come up. We're uh, in a new world. And so that's what we want to talk about tonight. And again, uh, hopefully at the end of this meeting, you'll be prompted to go and give your opinions to the province as to whether or not that should be implemented uh, on a going forward basis, all these changes. So Denise, I think I'm gonna start with you. And the first question that we sort of wanted to uh, explore was whether or not we need the consent of owners to uh, send them notices. Okay, um, and you touched on that. Rod, do you have a, any, any PowerPoint slide? I think you had I don't think I do actually. The next oh, one I do is okay. the next one I do is for, and I'm sorry if you did send me one. I kind of slipped through my fingers. Uh, no, that's, that's okay. Um, so you know, as you mentioned, Rod, um, until May 31st, 2021, this year, uh, you don't need agreements or consents from owners to send electronic notices. And depending on how the ministry handles all the feedback, we may never require that, but for now, um, until May 31st, you don't need that. Now, I, I, there's a been a lot of confusion from managers who've contacted me. They're not aware of this, but also consent to electronic notices, we're just dealing with the notices themselves. So preliminary notices, notices of meeting. If you're sending an email, if you have an email address for an owner, you could send emails to them. Uh, it's the condominium act specifically refers to notices. And that's where, when you're talking about electronic voting, those electronic voting is not a notice. You don't need consent to electronic voting before when there was a requirement for a bylaw. As long as you had the bylaw, then you could send electro electronic ballots to owners. Now, there's no requirement for a bylaw until May 31st. So you can send emails, that's electronic ballots to owners. You don't have to worry about consents. 
Right, and I think it's a very important distinction that you've made. Uh, uh, regardless of what's going to be the outcome of the cons consultation, even if we do end up going back to requiring consent from the owners, that really deals with the formal notifications under the Condominium Act. Certainly does not deal with it every communication. And so if, in fact, there's a, a communication from management, uh, even to advise of, of a breach of a rule or, 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 or whatnot, you don't need their consent. So that's that's got to be very clear. Um, okay, and so I guess the next question, and I'm going to take this one on, and I think you're right, we did have a slide, and I don't know where it ended up, and I apologize for that, but so the next question that I'll tackle is whether or not an owner can sort of opt out of this email notification, and you may get some pushback from some uh, owners who will say, well, I never consented to that, so so you cannot send me the package electronically. Um, and so you may get some pushback from, from some owners. I just turned my camera on. Hello, everybody. Hi, my name is Rod Escaola. I'm your condominium lawyer. I don't know what happened. I think my camera was off. Um, so you may get some pushback from some owners that may say, well, I never consented to that. And I want the package uh, in an envelope and I want to get a paper copy. So can owners opt out of email service and we don't we don't know the answer yet and i think the province has to turn its mind to that but what's interesting is that under the condominium act right now there's a section that deals with the address of service now the default address of service would likely be the unit but an owner under section 47 4 of the act could say well, okay well no actually i'm not going to accept um uh, service at the unit. Uh, imagine a situation where you're leasing your unit out, um, and 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 an owner could also take advise the corporation that they're not going to accept it by mail at the municipal address or at the door. Uh, you can't serve them properly at going to the unit. Now, if if an owner doesn't take a step to opt out, you can always serve at the municipal address of record. You can always serve by going to the door and sliding it under the door, but an owner could opt out of that. And so I can envision a situation where an owner would also be able to opt out of, of uh, email service. So I'm not. that's something I think that um, the province needs to turn its mind to. Um, can an owner eventually opt out of email service? And, and until the province makes accepts whatever changes they want to put in place, just keep in mind that for now, a, an address of service is one where you can accept mail by Canada Post. So that's something else that's going to change in the future. But for now, I would say this, certainly until the end of May, an owner cannot opt out of email notification. And that brings me to the next question, which is to Jose. Uh, how do you cajole owners into email communication? Because there's probably a bit of resistance uh, because it, it may feel different for owners. So how do you cajole them into email uh, communications? Oh, you'll just have to unmute first. We have our first unmuter. Boy, we have a hard time with technology tonight. Um, for us, it's part of our introduction meeting that we have with all owners and residents. Uh, we gather all the information, including the email address. Of course, you always present the, uh, the agreement to receive notifications by email. And if you have that, then it's easy enough. A lot of people do not fuss at that point. Sometimes they do want to opt out. They'll write in and say, I got your email. I have your 110 page package. Uh, great, thanks for that. I can't read it on my small phone. I want a, a printed copy. And we take that as an opportunity to discuss with them, you know, the, the administrative uh, costs and the mailing costs and all that good stuff of, of printing everything for them. We generally try to encourage them to remain on the list, uh, to not opt out of the list. We always do provide a few copies printed on site where they can go and pick it up at, at the site office or at the concierge's office. Uh, certainly for those who are unable to, to, to read it, you have to be a little bit concerned about accessibility. But for the most part, it, it works well. And it's also always a good uh, reminder for people. A, a lot of people will want to email you about other things, about ongoing events, about complaints, about requests. It's always a good idea uh, to make sure that you have a consent on file with them for communication by email and if you don't to remind them that you know you, you don't accept our communications uh by email and it would be preferable then if we stay uh, in paper print and i think sometimes when they realize that they won't necessarily be able to communicate that as frequently with you by email if they don't reciprocate and accept yours then it helps to motivate the the population of that list 
Okay, so the what's good for the goose is good for the gander, Jose school of thought. So basically, if somebody says to you, you can't communicate to me by email, well, maybe then he or she can't communicate with you by email, right? If we're going to go back to the telegraph and to the, press, pony, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, and to the Pony Express, that's kind of maybe a good way of incentivizing them. Now, I see some questions coming in, and a lot of you are sending the questions just to the panelists. I encourage all of you, when if you're going to put something in the chat, make sure that you click on uh, all attendees and panelists or whatever the option is, because otherwise only I get to see it. And I saw a question from Mama Janine in Ottawa who's wondering, well, what do we do with people that don't have um, an email address? And I wonder if I can turn that question maybe to Sean. I mean, like, how do you handle that? And I know that wasn't scripted. So good luck, Sean. Is he faking some technical difficulties? Jose, do you want to, or maybe Catherine, do you want to help us with this? Well, obviously, well, if you don't, don't have, have an email, email address, address, you do want to, them to be able to participate in your uh, virtual meeting. And Adam's going to help us out with some extra tips and tools that we now have. So you're going to make sure that they receive a printed package uh, so that they know all of the coordination details. Uh, as Jose mentioned, for instance, um, assisting within the community in teaming folks up so that they could learn some of the new technology. Um, I've had folks who, you know, have, uh, you know, arranged some physically distanced abilities or, you know, phoned a grandson or a granddaughter uh, to help them connect. So, you know, there are lots of opportunities there. Making sure that they know when the meeting is and to try to assist them to attend is very important. Right. Old-fashioned proxies are still good for being enfranchised, being able to exercise your vote. Uh, but some of the great things that Adam has later in the program, uh, I think, are going to be really interesting to everybody as well. Exactly. And at the end of the day, by the way, uh, it's no different than someone telling you that their, their service address of service is off site. I mean, so when you have your, your registry, when you have uh, the owner's registry, well, in some cases, you'll know to communicate with people by email. In other cases, you'll know that, you know, their address for service is, is their unit number. And in other cases, you'll know that their address of service is off site or maybe at, at a province. So it's not really different uh, in that sense. Is Sean, if Sean is back on, one of the questions I had for you, Sean, uh, is uh, what must you continue to send by mail or what should you really sort of keep sending by mail? Is Sean back on? I think he's dealing with some tech issues. He's trying to get himself back on. So Okay. So the answer to that question, dear folks, is this. There are some instances where you absolutely want to make sure that there's no question as to whether or not somebody received something. Any legal proceeding has to be served properly. If you're dealing with a question of arrears, I certainly would send it by email, but I would also serve uh, or send a copy at the municipal address or at the address of service you have on record because you don't want any sort of funny business. Oh, it went into my spam. I didn't get it, whatever it is. <laughs> so legal proceedings, very formal notifications. If you're dealing with a very contentious situation, I actually usually send it both by e email and uh, by the good old Royal Canadian uh, Post. Okay, so now let's go to David. And the next sort of question that we have on the agenda tonight is since we're now emailing uh, our good owners, all sorts of information and notices, does the anti-spam legislation apply? Can they sort of say, you're spamming me, stop sending, stop writing to me? Well, as someone who receives several dozens or hundreds of emails a day, I wish the anti-spam legislation applied to more things than it does. But uh, no, it does not apply to communications between the condominium and owners or management and owners. Uh, it's, it's really specific to commercial and electronic messages, which as we have here is, uh, is, is defined uh, to be, uh, you know, at, at, has its, at, at its purpose to encourage participation in a commercial activity, being purchasing, selling, bartering a product, providing a business. It is not meant to cover this communication uh, that owners receive. So uh, if, if property managers out there are getting the stop spamming me, that's not spam. Um, it's, it's legitimate communication that's, uh, that owners uh, are, should be receiving that way. Right. Absolutely. Now, again, at the end of the day, certainly after May 31st, depending on how the province changes its approach, I, I think the proper etiquette, if somebody absolutely does not want to be communicated with uh, via email, that's 
probably a legitimate request. But as Josie explained, you got to explain to them the realities of life and what that means and, and the impact it has. But it's not spam and the anti-spam legislation does not apply. So now turning to uh, uh, Graham, uh, the next question that we often hear is whether and I'm not sure if we say PIPEDA or PIPEDA, but certainly whether the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act apply. So uh, let, let me start with this question, uh, Graham. If you were to summarize on a T-shirt what PIPEDA deals with, what is it that they deal with? Uh, so if I were to summarize it on a T-shirt, I would actually probably put something very similar to what's in the slide there. B basically, PIPEDA or PIPEDA, call it whatever you want, just don't call it late to dinner, is um, it's federal legislation and it applies to every organization in respect of any personal information that that organization is using or collecting or disclosing in the course of its commercial activities. And so what the purpose of this act is, is to ensure that when an organization is collecting or using or giving out personal information, that it's doing so for only the proper and right purposes. It's not doing anything unlawful or nefarious and that there's proper checks and balances in place to make sure that uh, people's information isn't improperly being used without their knowledge or consent. Okay, so really a piece of legislation that's there to protect personal information. Are you able to give us a, a brief summary of what personal information is or did you already do this and I missed it? Uh, no, I didn't, but I mean, uh, without, without citing the act, it's, it's pretty much any information about a person that could identify them, their address, uh, their uh, location, their coordinates, their income, anything like that, or their health information these days, that's been relevant. But uh, I, I mean, for the most part, uh, right. anything under the sun that could identify or is related to that individual. Including email addresses, including name. Yeah, yeah. So unit absolutely, number, you know, phone uh, number, address, you know, anything no, to contact absolutely. them. Okay. Exactly. And so the next question then, uh, Graham, would be this: uh, Does uh, PIPEDA apply to the condominium world? And so the the answer to that is maybe. Uh, it depends who you ask. Uh, I, personally, I, I, and I mean, I'll preface this by saying we don't have any sort of judicial answer on this one way or the other. I, I would say that a lot of the authority seems to say no. Some of the authority suggests maybe. Uh, and, and as I'll get to at the end of this, the best practice is to certainly operate as though you are living in a world in which it does apply. So um, this is how, and I mean, a pro tip for, for most legislation, a, a lot of legislation has a section called application that tells you what, uh, what it governs, what it's about. And PIPEDA, it applies to organizations that collect, use, or disclose information in the course of commercial activities. And it goes on to say that it does not apply to, and this is important, it does say to any individual that is collecting, using, or disclosing information for personal or domestic purposes. And we'll get back to that in a little bit later. And then uh, I also, as a little bit of more flavor, it's also important to note that under PIPEDA, an organization can disclose personal information without that person's consent or knowledge if the disclosure is required by law. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Go ahead. Okay, so well, what I was gonna say is that's what the act tells us. And, and I think what's important there is what's highlighted and bolded uh, is that uh, it applies to anything that any organization that's collecting information in the course of commercial activities. So like I said, we don't have any sort of uh, ruling from the court on whether this applies to, uh, to condominiums, but the condominium authority tribunal has weighed in on this question. And I think I have some of that on the next slide. So, as you can see here, uh, the Condominium Authority Tribunal, which again, primarily deals with records requests, um, it, uh, just go back one slide. It has uh, in 2020 on a couple of occasions had the opportunity to address whether, um, whether PIPEDA applies to condominiums uh, when answering records requests. And it has on multiple occasions found that PIPEDA probably does not apply here. Um, in the two decisions I've got uh, referenced here, I think the, the lessons that can be learned are from the top one, and uh, those citations are there in case anybody wants to, uh, wants to you know, give themselves some nice reading material. Um, in, in the top one, the authority tribunal found that because there was no evidence that the condo was engaged in commercial activities, 
uh, that it didn't really seem like Pipita applied. And even if the condo was engaged in commercial activities, because the records request uh, sections under the act and its regulations require these records and documents to be provided to owners on a proper request, then under section 73I of Pipita that I had read earlier, because it's required by law, the organization being the condo would have to give that information over anyway. And so in the second uh, CAT case we've got there, the question was asked, well, hold on, what about if a condo is you know, hiring contractors or employees? Doesn't that sound a little bit like commercial activity? And uh, the tribunal found that, sure, maybe it sounds a bit like commercial activity, but it noted that when a condo does something you know, to manage the property or the assets of the corporation, it is doing that on behalf of the owners. And so if it's doing something like that on behalf of the owners, it's really doing it in a residential sense rather than in a commercial sense. And it went on and that's not here, but it did go on to find that, uh, you know, if you make the comparison between a condo and say, you know, a normal house, a non-condo residential situation, if somebody living in their house hires a contractor to do something, it's not really a commercial activity. And so the, the, that was extrapolated to if a condo is doing that on behalf of the residents, it may not be a commercial activity. In any event, uh, as Let we know- Let me just the, interrupt you. Yeah. Let me just interrupt you, uh, uh, Graham. You're, you're serving the entire buffet here. This is fantastic. Uh, um, but let me just push you along uh, simply to sort of get to the, to the finish line here. So the, I guess my question will be whether it applies or not. And I think, I think the answer is, is what? It's, it's, it does not apply because it's not a commercial activity, right? Well, I mean, that, that, that seems to be the way the, the wind is blowing. That's taken so far. Yeah. Um, again, you know, we don't have a judge who's commented and, and, and on that. I think that. there's at least that. Right. Okay. But regardless, I guess, uh, let me ask this question. What would be the best practices? Well, I mean, the best practice is to certainly conduct yourself in such a way that you treat any personal information you collect with as much care as is possible. You only disclose what absolutely has to be disclosed. You keep private information and personal information as close to your chest as you can. And you ensure that any collection or disclosure of private information that you are engaged in, you have to make sure it's in accordance with the Condominium Act. And so it's also probably uh, in every corporation's best, uh, best interest to conduct themselves as if PIPEDA does apply to them just in case. Um, so that would mean that it's worth looking into appointing a privacy officer for your uh, condominium to ensure that uh, you're complying with PIPEDA. And uh, in order to do that, the best practice is to probably implement a privacy policy. Um, I, like I say, you know, even if PIPEDA doesn't strictly apply, it certainly can't hurt to have an extra check and balance in there to make sure that the uh, owner's information is being treated uh, with the care it deserves. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so very much. Uh, we seem to be having a delay and I think it's on my end. So hopefully you can hear me. I've turned my camera off. You won't be disappointed. Uh, my face hasn't changed. It's the only face I got anyways. But can you hear me, uh, Graham? Yep. Yeah, okay, perfect. Wonderful. So let me let me move on to the next topic because I, I really don't want us to run out of time and, um, and hopefully we'll be able for the next... Uh, webinar to to have a better signal one of the question that comes very often is this can what kind of information can we provide to third party service providers for instance what kind of information can i provide a, a condo voter or get core obligations of any kind if i as a corporation am disclosing because obviously for, for electronic voting to work, I need to send someone like the good people at Condo Voter, I need to send them the name of, of my owners and I need to send them their email address and I need to send them information as to whether they're in arrears and so on and so forth. So the question that came up was whether or not the disclosure of this information uh, amounted to some kind of a breach of some kind. Uh, and while we know that uh, uh, Pipeta likely doesn't apply to condos, that, that doesn't mean you can just go around and disclose all sorts of information. 
So I think uh, the starting point to answer this question will be this. This is not a new question. It's new in the context of electronic voting, but corporations have been providing information to third-party service providers for, for, for decades. I mean, think of your property manager. They have all the information. They, they hold the caramel secret, and, and they, know, they know where you live. They know your name. They know if you're in arrears. They know the weight of your cat. They know all of that information. And so that's not new. Similarly, when you when you uh, retain a lawyer and you tell them, okay, well, you know, uh, Graham is in breach of whatever X Y Z rule, and you know, I get information to be able to write to Graham and tell him that his cat is overweight, right? And so this is not new. And what you have to keep in mind is that there's a fundamental difference between disclosing information and transferring information for the purpose of processing. And this is exactly what's happening now in this new digital era. What's happening is that the corporation will turn some information, and you need to be very focused on that. You can't just turn the, the whole book uh, to, to condo voter or to whoever or to get quorum. You got to provide the information that's required for the purpose um, of the task that you're delegating. You're basically delegating a task to a service provider uh, in order to um, uh, gain some efficiencies. And, and by doing that, you transfer this information for the purpose of processing it only. Now, having said that, this transfer of information that takes place behind the curtains, you have to take whatever steps you can as a corporation to ensure that you're, you're providing this information to people that are trustworthy, to people that have at the very least the same level, the same, same precautions uh, and same safeguards as you would to protect and preserve this information. And you want to make sure in your contracts uh, with Condo Voter and with uh, GetCorm, you want to make sure that they're not going to disclose this information to a third party or to somebody else. And they're not going to use that to suddenly spam you with, uh, you know, an invitation to, to whatever, to various cruises or to buy books or to whatever it is, right? And so as long as you're transferring only the information that's required for the purpose that it is required, and you're doing so in the context where there's, there's a clear agreement with the service provider as to how they will treat that information, then you're good. Then you're not uh, inappropriately disclosing uh, information. And I think what I'm going to do eventually is I'm going to post a, a link to um, a, an article from the Canadian Privacy Commissioner on that very same question. It's a bit old, but it's very easy to sort of uh, to understand, and it kind of encapsulates the, the debate over improper disclosure of information versus um, uh, transferring for processing. Denise, anything to add to this? Uh no, I think um, you know, most uh, third-party providers, and I know Condo Voter has this because I looked at it, they have their terms, they have a privacy policy. So those are the things that you want to make sure that the service provider has. Uh, and, and you've really summarized it well, Rob. Okay, perfect. So let's turn, uh, let's put the Adam on the hot seat now. And so um, what information... Uh, do you need, Adam? What's what's the kind of information that you need, and what's the information you don't want or you don't need? Yeah, it's a good question. It's fairly basic information. We'll actually provide a template for an owner's list to be sent to us to ensure that we only receive the information that is required, um, that protects us, and it also protects you. That information is first name, last name, unit number, email, uh, going forward, and, and included now phone numbers as well. Uh, if that unit is in arrears, we don't need any other information other than just notifying that they are in arrears or not in arrears. Uh, owner-occupied units, and that's for the purpose of dynamic ballots, if an uh, owner-occupied can only vote on a certain position, as well as uh, joint owners or uh, related owners. Okay. Uh, and Catherine, what kind of information uh, do, do you not provide? I think the information that, Adam's okay. kind of, you know, included, if they are in arrears, it's because they are ineligible to vote, which is relevant to what Adam is doing. The value of that arrears is completely irrelevant to what he's doing. So it's that kind of detail that you're looking to remove or excise from any of the records. And that's simply because what you're doing further to what Graham presented earlier is you're providing information with a purpose and only for that purpose and no extraneous information. 
Okay, perfect, wonderful, thank you. One of the questions that I saw in the uh, in the chat line is whether or not, uh, since we're talking about disclosing information, whether or not owners are entitled to get the name and address of other owners. Uh, Denise, do you wanna answer that in 15 seconds or less? Yeah, that's, I think that we all know that uh, you can get it through a records request. Owners are entitled to names um, and unit numbers of other owners. It's an owner's list, but not email addresses or not phone numbers, definitely not. Perfect. Unless, of course, uh, there's some communities where people voluntarily provide some of that information to do like a kind of a condo or a phone booklet or whatnot. That's something else. I mean, if people consent to that, obviously. But otherwise, just like Benny said, you, you, you get the address, you get the name, but you don't get the email address. So moving on to the next topic, uh, hopefully we're not going to run out of time, is I want to deal with privacy of voting And, and I wanna deal with this in three stage, whether the results is relevant, knowing it ahead of the meeting, whether or not an owner should be, or sorry, whether or not the corporation should be able to get a sneak peek at the results. And then we're gonna ask about what about at the meeting, what information should be provided about the results of the election at the meeting. And then the next question or the next phase will be, what about after the meeting? And so I'm going to start with you, Denise, and I'm gonna ask you this question, which is, should Condo Corps get, get uh, an advanced sneak peek at uh, you know how many votes we got in and which way the wind is blowing and, and so on and so forth. Um, I've been wrestling with this and I think uh, many of us that have done these virtual meetings happen. Um, so there's a difference between uh, knowing uh, whether you have form for a meeting or whether you know whether you're going to have enough votes to pass a bylaw versus knowing um, who the, how the directors are do, doing, how the candidates are doing, and what the results are before they're finalized. Uh, and I think some of the, the reason that this has been a bit complicated is because of advanced voting versus electronic proxies. So when you're dealing with advanced voting, uh, you know, th those are votes that are very, pretty much like putting a ballot in a ballot box, although you can change your electronic vote um, all the way from when you start two weeks ahead of the meeting until the meeting itself. With electronic proxies and proxies, uh, you can actually see the votes. So you can see who is voted for who. And so that, that is part of the problem here is that if you're using an electronic proxy system, you get to see how the directors are doing uh, and details as to how a bylaw vote is going. And I'm not sure that's how it should be. And I think what the difficulty here is, this is all new to us. We're concerned about uh, the integrity of the voting system. So really, should we not know how the vote is going until the actual meeting starts? I'm just throwing that out there. And I know this is, we will be debated here amongst the panelists. Right. And, and so there's a various schools of thoughts on this. Maybe I'm going to turn to Jose. Uh, and, and I think what skews the question or the discussion is this, is that uh, in some cases, when people are voting by proxy, some people say, well, ahead of time, I know, know the, the management knows how many proxies came in and they may even know what's in the proxy. And so some of the questions that are people asking is, well, why are we treating the electronic voting differently uh, than, than, the, than the proxy vote? Uh, and, and I'm not sure we are treating them differently. So Jose, yesterday, I think you had a fairly strong point of view. Um, with how to let's let's deal with proxies first with the information that's found in the proxies do you know that ahead of time can you sort of read the results um it is a, it is an option uh, i think you can communicate with the service provider and, and some some of them certainly will tell you the results of a uh, bylaw vote i don't think they would uh disclose i would hope not disclose uh information on a director vote but certainly uh the the question has been asked of service providers how am I doing? Do I have my bylaw passed yet? Yes or no, how are we doing? So that you know whether or not you, you uh, should go canvas for more proxies. I disagree with that practice. Uh, it, 
in in our condominium corporations uh, always when we solicited proxies in the past i'm not should not say solicited we're not allowed to do that but when the package went out and said there's a proxy on the last page if you complete a pro proxy please put it in a sealed envelope clearly marked proxy and addressed to the board secretary it goes to the board and those proxies are opened at the registration you don't know in advance whether or not you're you're going to achieve what you're trying to do with that meeting and i think that's proper that's protecting the integrity of the voting process I want to know whether or not I have sufficient votes to come in to, to hold the meeting. Do I have quorum? I will communicate with the service provider and say, I need 51% uh, to proceed with this vote. Do I have 51% of my votes in? And they say, no, 35, 38%. Then I'll, I'll, wrote to my, I'll write to my ownership to encourage them to, to submit proxies and to vote. But you shouldn't be, uh, that, that email shouldn't be skewed. You shouldn't be telling them, you know, we're almost there. We almost achieved what we were trying to get done. You just want the votes to come in. I, I don't think it's proper that, that the manager or the board know in advance. Okay. Uh, let me just, I try to change my microphone. Hopefully that's a bit better. I'm not too sure. Uh, one of the questions I guess that we're struggling with is this, is that sometimes, especially when you've, I, I think what, what is clear, let me just open a, a bracket here. What is clear is that the, if we're talking about electing directors, uh, none of that is known ahead of time. I think everybody's on board on that. That's not even a question. The question where we're, the, the struggle, if there is a struggle is how do we deal with um, whether or not we'll have achieved quorum for the purpose of passing a bylaw. That's the only question that is worth having a discussion around. And, and in real life, in the in-person meetings, You'd, you know, you'd look in the room and if you don't have 50% of the ownership present, well, then you know that, you know, you won't be able to proceed to a vote and then you, you know, you can invite a motion from the floor and then you can adjourn the meeting and then you can, uh, you know, postpone that vote at, at a later date. And so the issue, though, is that in, in, in the virtual world, um, you may not know ahead of time whether or not you have enough votes to, to, to meet quorum. So that's, I think that's the struggle that, that we're kind of talking about. Anything to add, Denise or Jose? Well, about I, I think the difficulty here, and, and a lot of condom lawyers are participating in this practice, is you may know that you have 60% of the owners who have voted for the bylaw, but, um, and I know, I think, Adam, you've taken this question from lawyers who say, well, we have 60%, but has the bylaw been voted in favor? Because we want to know if we should adjourn the meeting. If we adjourn the meeting, we'll be able to get more votes in favor. And this is, you know, the difficulty that I have on, on you know, how the practice of adjourning has taken place now with virtual meetings and whether that information should be provided. Should you know that owners have voted in favor of a bylaw before you decide to adjourn? Yeah. So I guess the question, and maybe that's the way to approach it, is this. Uh, how many votes have come in? So what's the person? I, not, I don't care which way or which way they voted, but so have we reached, how many votes have we received? Because we need to know if we have quorum to even proceed. And the next question could be, have we received 50 votes one way or the other, as opposed to how close are we to, to passing the, you know, the finish line? Have we received 50% one way or the other? And if the answer is, no, you haven't received 50% one way or the other, I'm, you know, I'm not sort of canvassing the vote. I'm not sort of trying to stack the cards. Then I know, well, we don't have enough to really know one way or the other, whether you have 50% of the owners in favor or against the bylaw. So that, I, I don't know if that's too yeah. cute, but. Well, but it works differently with electronic proxies. That's advanced voting with electronic How? proxies. You know that information. I think that information right. is made available. So you, right. do, you right. know, yeah. So it's up right. to the chair's decision whether they want to adjourn the meeting or not. Right. Oh my goodness, we have nine minutes left. Okay, we'll stop that topic. Okay, uh, so what about the results at the meeting? Uh, I'm going to go to David. Uh, David, uh, so at the meeting, we know that Denise has been elected. We know that, let's say, Jose has not been elected. Uh, often we hear, well, we want to know the numbers. What's, what's the best practice? Yeah, so our, it, this also came up in the chat as well, and so I know it's it's a popular question, and it came up in some of the uh, the meetings that I, that I personally chaired as well over this this uh, past few months. There's there's nothing that prescribes you know th that you must divulge the exact numbers of who was voted in, and I mean our practice has been 
not to divulge those numbers. It's very easy to say who's who's who has been elected. And, you know, there are certain records of the corporation that are held on the back end. If someone really wants to do a records request, they might be able to get something afterwards. But I mean, it, it's our practice not to not to announce the, you know, Jane got 10 votes and John got one vote and that one vote was from his only friend in the condo. It, it could be embarrassing for people, you know, so we, we've kind of taken that position to just not uh, not give the exact numbers other than to provide the results of who has been elected. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if Sean is back on the line, is he? Uh, yeah, uh, oh. but nothing to add. Uh, David, uh, David nailed it. Uh, we don't see an upside to disclosing the, the actual vote results for directors. So we don't do that as a, as a general rule. Right. And as David said, I think if somebody really wants it, you can say, well, you can always put in a, a, a records request. And so that brings me to the last leg of this discussion. But what about after the meeting? Are people entitled to know after the meeting that, you know, Jose got one vote and that, uh, you know, Graham got 100 votes? Like, is that information that they're allowed to get? It's a record of the corporation after the meeting. You have a scrutineers report. Um, that scrutineers of the meeting would register with the condominium corporation. It's something that can be requested. Uh, okay. Sometimes the reason why folks do want to have that information announced at the meeting is they feel it, it may um, stop somebody from making a records request after the meeting. Uh, but I tend to believe that that's something that is the natural course of business. And uh, I want to make sure that as many people as possible or who may be interested uh, serve as directors uh, run in elections. And I don't want ever for anybody to be discouraged because they didn't get a, a grand yeah. number of votes. So I think that's right. the, the better course of action. Okay. Adam, we uh, called you in tonight to talk about telephone voting, and we're sort of running out of time, but I want to make sure we, we discuss that because there's a, yet another option that is being offered to owners. I mean, first we went with electronic voting, then some people said, well, what about people that are not familiar with the practice? What about people that don't have any computers? And so tell us more about this brand new telephone voting. And you'll have to sort of summarize it a bit because I think we're running out of time a bit. Uh, of course. So this is a question we hear all the time. It's the first question we get. What if I don't have a computer? On this session today, I saw those questions coming in the chat. For the property managers joining us today, it's going to be the first question that you get as well. So we quite often look for accessibility features to ensure that we can increase participation across the board. This was something that was born out of those discussions is the ability for people to phone in and place their vote through keypad presses. So the way that this works is a PIN number is provided that's specific to the unit, very similar to a secure token for an electronic ballot. You can call into, in our case, the condo voter voting line. You use that PIN number and that identifies who you are and your unit, your building. It's all the information to you stored in our database. And we walk you through the process. And essentially we walk you through with intelligent AI and it's text to speech. And that's important because we know that the ballot can change many times over especially with advanced voting. We'll see candidates register after uh, the nomination goes out, specifically in the cases of nominations from the floor during meetings. So this vote by phone accommodates all of those real time changes. You phone in, you follow those prompts, you place your vote using the keypad or, uh, keypad or voice recognition. And by doing so, that information is stored electronically in line with all of the electronic voting that we have received in advance as well. So this all happens simultaneously and it builds upon the existing feature sets of our product. You get a confirmation of how you voted that can be vocalized over the phone as you put in those entries. You also receive an email if your email's on file as well. You can actually use both processes. You can place your original vote through ballot and then at the meeting itself, if there's a nomination from the floor, you can phone in in real time and update that ballot preference before voting closes. Uh, a lot of benefits are offered here. It's an alternative to paper or electronic proxies. It integrates directly with the existing platforms, results are available in real time, provides those additional accessibility options, and it's full flexibility to change your vote right from the get-go all the way to the end of the uh, meeting closing, voting closing, and again, dynamically accumulates the nominations from the floor. I do have a sample, Rod, if we have time where I can actually play for everyone to hear what that call would sound like. Uh, it's about a minute 45. If you would let me play that, I do have that here to go. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, maybe not the full two minute 45 seconds, but just maybe the beginning so we get a flavor of it. No problem. You can cut me off. You should be able to go ahead now. So one second there, and if you can just confirm when you can hear this. Yeah. Perfect. 
Thank you for calling Condo Voters Telephone Voting System. For security purposes, please enter your six-digit access number at any time. Your access number will have been sent to you via mail, text, email, or by phone. If you are missing your access number, please contact your property management representative. So that's the sound of the key presses at someone actually entering their PIN code. Thank you. And welcome owner of unit number 106 and building number CVCC 1001. If this information is correct, please press 1. If this information is not correct, please hang up and contact your property's management for further assistance. Okay, I guess Thank we you. get it. You will be voting on four ballots. Ballot number one is for the election of directors. There are two open positions, which means you may vote two candidates in this position. There are a total of four candidates. Okay, I think we got it. The name of each. Thank you for letting me. Play that's that. wonderful. So yeah. I mean, it's. You know, that's that, no problem. So it, it clearly provides, it's very flexible. It provides you with all the options. Uh, you know, if you have, uh, you need to stop sharing your screen because I'm going to take it over again, uh, Adam. Should be good. Okay, wonderful. Um, not that we have an exciting slide, but at least you get to see when's the next uh, uh, webinar. Okay, so that's very good. And so uh, there's really no excuse now for people not to be able to participate to these uh, new sort of uh, virtual meetings. People can vote electronically people can vote by phone. And I mean, people have been used to voting, to, to doing things by phone for the longest time. I mean, we'd probably have to go back to the Spanish flu to find someone that um, was not, uh, you know, able to um, work it through a phone, I guess. So that's good. Uh, anything else to add, uh, Adam, before we move on? No, those are really the highlights. Yeah. Thank you okay, for letting well, me share that today, Rob. And we okay, look forward no. to any feedback that anyone has. You can find more information on the website, condovoter.com. Wonderful. And we'll put a, a link to it. Okay, folks, we're at a one minute uh, before six o'clock uh, and lots of you have to go for supper. So what we're going to do this time around, we, for the parting words, I actually have a topic for each of you. And so it's not going to be the kumbaya moment. I actually need information from you. I'm going to start with you, Sean. I'm going to thank you for being uh, uh, a, a usual uh, member of our crew, but I'm going to ask you this. Tell us about this uh, fillable status certificate that appears to, uh, to now be available on the CAO's website. Yeah, absolutely. The, the CAO dropped a new uh, fillable PDF of the status certificate on their website, I believe it was Monday. Uh, great uh, initiative by them. It's a, it's a nice form in many ways. The, the challenge is it only allows you to enter one unit on the form. Uh, and of course, uh, many owners own a, a dwelling unit and a parking unit, dwelling parking and lockers, etc. Uh, which traditionally would be contained on one status certificate if it's in the same corporation for the same owner. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. We put a call into the CAO to try to get clarification from them. Uh, I won't expect a response for another week or two, uh, but uh, we're certainly following up on that because that limits your ability to use it properly from our perspective. Okay. Well, the only thing I'm going to add to this is I actually reached out to them. Uh, I didn't have that question and they actually responded quite, 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 quite quickly. Actually. Oh, nice. Right. And so uh, to my surprise, this form has been available for, for many, 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 many months, actually. So I it oh. kind of sort of maybe we didn't have a, a party around the form. Uh, and so because I it's also learned of it, uh, I also learned of it this week, I think. Denise, my question to you is this. Uh, thank you first for being uh, part of our group as usual. But my question to you is this, Denise, from uh, Lash Condo Law. If the province allows e-meeting and e-voting uh, moving forward, do we still need a bylaw? Well, I guess it will depend on what the legislation is. You know, will it be in the regulation and, and how detailed will it be? Because as you know, Rod, and you and I worked on this bylaw together, our bylaws are pretty detailed. They're like two to three pages of bylaw. So unless those provisions are really incorporated into the legislation, it may still make sense for corporations to do these bylaws. Okay, no, I agree. I agree because we want to make sure that the process is transparent. We want to make sure that it's robust. We want to make sure that it provides owners with real time, meaningful participation. We don't want people to do their AGMs on TikTok. We don't want people to prevent uh, owners, full owner participation. So that's, I think it will be important to see what the province does. And if not, a bylaw will uh, bring all of that added value to the table. Uh, Graham, did we get Jason back on the line? Uh, no, we did not get Jason okay. back on the line. 
So we'll move on to Catherine. Catherine, thank you so much for being with us. Catherine of Crossbridge also speaking on behalf of uh, ACMO. And my question to you, Catherine, uh, maybe some uh, words of wisdom about uh, COVID fatigue and not letting our guards down. It's very important and I'll, I'll put in a plug on behalf of Jason because when he participated in our call in advance of this yesterday, he wanted us all to go back to basics to take a look and make sure we were documenting things properly. Uh, I know in my neck of the woods, there have been uh, reports, they've published the fact that they will be uh, visiting condominiums to ensure that they are compliant. So this is a, a, a key, a reminder to you, make sure you have all of the necessary signage related to masks and physical distancing. Make sure you have your safety plan in place and updated, especially if you first put it together way back when they uh, first came out in April. And if you're looking for a resource, the CMRAO at their website does have one posted and it's based on the reopening plan or framework. Um, we're all a little bit tired, a little bit exhausted, uh, but these things are important. So good reminders to everybody. I'll follow up with one item um, on the fillable proxy. Uh, perhaps it's intentional. Um, and that's because individual parcels are individually deeded and titled, and they may not be being transacted at the same time. So be cautious, be conscientious of that when you do have a status certificate request, um, because it, it may not be intended that they sell all of their parking spaces during the same transaction. Yeah. I, I think the issue may be, though, that sometimes they are being transacted together, and so you end up having to issue three status certificates. Uh, and so I understand I, uh, the problem, yeah, and, yeah, and maybe yeah, that is sure. as it should be. Um, uh, that's just a, a point to be made from my side of the fence. Okay, and so Jose, uh, parting words, and maybe the, the unscripted question to you is, uh, are you gonna charge three uh, status certificates for the guy that has the uh, unit, the parking and the uh, locker? Not a chance. <laughs> Not a chance, wonderful. Okay, uh, uh, thank you Jose for being uh, part of the crew again. Uh, and uh, I'm going to keep moving on because we are past the six o'clock deadline and I can just smell the cooking in the kitchen right now. David, uh, 35 seconds or, or less on the new slip and fall protocol that we keep postponing. Yeah, yeah, I keep having slides prepared for this. Um, so very quickly, the Occupier's Liability Act has been amended um, and this now requires uh, 60 days uh, noted, sorry, excuse me, within 60 days of an, a slip and fall incident, um, the person who suffered the injury must notify the occupier. So in the cases of condos at the condominium corporation of the date, time and location of the occurrence, or else they may be statute barred from bringing that claim to court afterwards, except with certain exceptions, if the injury resulted in death, or if there is some sort of reasonable excuse and um, the defendant is not prejudiced uh, in its ability to defend the claim. So 60 days is now the new deadline for those types of slip and falls. Right. For the injured party to give a notification to the corporation. And that gives the corporation a good chance to go grab evidence and most importantly, go and clear the ice patch and make sure that you don't get a second slip and fall there. Uh, Graham, uh, you're the conclusion today about the uh, Ontario consultation. Uh, well, like I said, you know, we, or I didn't say it, but like has been said, we don't know what's going to come of that or, or what changes it's going to bring about. But uh, it is important to uh, to try and get as many viewpoints in to to hopefully bring the act into modern, modernity uh, in such a way that will still work with everybody and and reflect what actual uh, condo living is like. Okay, uh, so you folks have until February 8th to go and, and give your points of view to the province. We're going to put a link uh, on, on our website. Adam from Condo Voter, I'd like to thank you, but also I'm going to ask you one quick one before we go. One pointer to make a V meeting a success in one sentence. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Rod, so much for having us. I was happy to share that with you guys today. It's always a pleasure to be on here. Uh, quick tip for success, ensure you have accurate databases of record. Make sure your emails are up to date, make sure your phone numbers are up to date and your unit records are up to date. Uh, it saves us time, but more importantly, it saves you time because those owners are going to contact you and ask, why didn't I receive my item or why was it sent to with a different email? Uh, so accurate uh, database of records, keep it up to date. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So folks, this is it for us. We went just slightly over six o'clock. My apologies for that. Apologies also for the technical issues that we've been having uh, throughout. 
Uh, hopefully we'll be able to sort this out next time around. This was episode 21. Our next meeting on March 3rd, uh, Wednesday again, uh, the information will be posted on Condo Advisor. Uh, the top uh, right corner webinar allows you, to, if you click on that, you'll be able to sort of see, uh, to register, you'll see the topic, you'll see the speakers. Uh, and so that's all where we put all the information. Thank you so much for those who stuck around until uh, almost uh, seven past six. Uh, and thank you to all the speakers. We'll get to see you next month, everybody. Have a great evening. Wash your hands, wear a mask, and let's uh, keep on the good fight. Thank you. Good night, everybody.